Okay, this is going to sound strange, but in the first Harry Potter novel, we observe Harry in his charms class, learning the hand movements and incantations that are required to levitate a feather off the surface of a table. He doesn't get it right away. It seems so easy for his friend Hermione Granger to do it. Just a flick and swish, she says. When Harry finally gets it, the reader feels the lightness from finally being able to produce the magic. His life goes from ordinary human in that moment to wizard, because he's finally the master of his own innate abilities. He has control over what once felt uncontrollable. We're going to talk to someone today who went to a type of therapy called OEI. In OEI, the therapist uses a series of hand motions, such as sweeping and switching, that the client tracks with their eyes while recounting the story of their trauma. This physiological activity, together with observing the emotions that arise during this process, create their own kind of magic for the client. It can help lift the heaviness of a trauma off of one's chest. Today, I'm going to be talking with Fatima and her experience with OEI. I'm Talia Singer, and this is Whatever Works. Hi, Fatima. How are you? Hi, Talia. I'm very good. How are you? I'm good. I'm so glad you could join me today to tell us a little bit about your story. Well, thank you for having me. Fatima says that in her 20s, she wanted to go see a therapist to deal with some family conflict, but was really put off by the lack of cultural competence by the therapist that she saw, who advised her to cut off ties with a family member that was causing her issues in her family dynamics. Fatima was really saddened by this therapist's advice because it really went against all of her cultural values. And this time when she needed a therapist, she looked for someone who could really understand her. I think a part of it was just this need that I had within me thinking that this couldn't be it, right? Like I I could find someone who was more culturally competent, but also going through that undergrad degree, I learned that there are people who are trained in different things, right? Like therapy is not like a one size fits all process. Um, And I learned about this great resource called Psychology Today, which has a listing of all the therapists in your area. Um, And, you know, back then, this was huge for me, because you can narrow down therapists based on their gender, based on the language they spoke, or the modality that they use. So for me, that just made the process easier, because I felt like I wasn't going into another session, almost like blind to who this therapist was. What were you looking for when you typed into psychology today? Primarily someone who was South Asian. Um, I was looking for someone who was a little bit younger, like in their 20s, 30s at that time. Um, I also looked for someone who spoke the same language that I spoke at home, which was, you know, Hindi. And the reason I did that was because there was a lot of family drama going on in my life that I could have only explained in that language. Like it would have only... Um, made sense if I said word for word what had happened. Um, And although, you know, I've spoken English since I was a kid, English, I would consider my first language. There's a lot of stuff that, you know, culturally you can convey in Hindi that you wouldn't be able to do in English. I'm thinking probably much more than just the expressions themselves. It's like the emotions that they convey, those particular phrases. Absolutely. And so I I would love to hear about your experience with OEI. A year ago, I was uh, a victim of uh, break and enter into my home. I sought out help because I was experiencing what I think was uh, symptoms of PTSD at that time. So, you know, I sought out a therapist uh, with these same qualifications, like someone who's South Asian, um, handy speaking, kind of on the younger side, because I just wanted that familiarity again. Um, and my first session with my therapist was just kind of your run of the mill sessions where they ask you about your history and what had happened and this, that, the other thing. And, you know, my therapist turns to me and says, you know, I think you do really well with OEI. And I said, okay, sure. Like, what does that entail? Like, what do we have to do? Honest to God, it was the weirdest thing. Like, even now that I think about it, because 
you literally, so the therapist had me stand on one side of the room with one of my eyes covered and she did something with her hands. So she almost like moved her hands um, in front of me, uh, asking me to follow with my eyes and retell the story of the break and enter. And I'm thinking, okay, well, first of all, it's hard to talk about the break and enter, but now she's got me following her hand movements with my eyes and my one of my eyes is uncovered. And I'm thinking, well, this is just complete BS. Like there's nothing that's going to come out of it. Funny enough, the first session, she actually concluded that a lot of my trauma memory was on the right side of my body, which is, which was really interesting for me because I'm actually a lot sore on my right side of the body, like my right shoulder gets sore, my right hip is all kinds of messed up. But I always feel like whenever I talked about that incident, that for whatever reason, my right side of the body would tense up a little bit more. I'm just wanting to clarify, Fatima, that somebody broke into your home while you were there. That sounds so scary. Absolutely. And like, you know, it took a couple of sessions, but we came to the conclusion that this was happening because when the break in under happened, the way I was oriented in my apartment, the right side of my body was closest to the front door. So whenever I had memories about the break in under, whenever I thought about, you know, someone kind of like breaking down my door... I would always, you know, it would, it would almost feel like I heard it first in my right ear, then my left ear. And I'm very curious how she determined this. Well, listen to this. So she had me first cover my left eye, did the hand movements, had me tell the story of what had happened that day. And, you know, easy as pie, I'm kind of saying it and it's fine. Then she's like, okay, Fatima, we'll switch to the right eye. So now cover your left eye and do the same thing follow my hands and tell me the story again and this time I choked up I couldn't like I couldn't get past like the first little bit of what happened um and I just you know I started breathing heavily um my eyes started twitching which was really weird because I had just done it two minutes ago and I was fine there were at least to me there was no explanation of why it would be a hard thing to do and that is how she made sense of the fact that, okay, well, you're holding on to all that trauma on, on the right side of your body. Wow. Yeah, it's it's weird, but it worked. Okay, then what? So you determined that the trauma is on the right side of your body. What is What happens after that? So the whole, I think, from what I understood, the whole process of OEI is to integrate the trauma memory with your retelling of it so that you don't feel so physiologically aroused every time you talk about it or think about it. So she would make me tell parts of the story. So the, yeah, I'm, and kind of going back, the first thing she did was take my story and break it up into maybe 10 chunks. And we would work on one part of the story until that anxiety had subsided and then move on to the next. So what she would do is, okay, Fatima, tell me part of the story with your left eye uncovered. And then, um, then she'd do the same thing on the right eye. And then she'd do it over and over again with her hand movements until you can, you know, she would visibly see that my anxiety had reduced. And I also felt better. So the way she saw my anxiety had reduced is that, you know, I wasn't twitching as much. I wasn't swaying. So whenever um, she had my right eye uncovered, and told me to tell the story, initially, I would sway following the movements of her hand. For, for whatever reason, it didn't, didn't make any sense to me that I was standing there. There's no reason for me to be swaying right? I don't have a balance problem. But whenever I was telling the story and watching her hands move, I would start swaying with her hand. And I think that was indicative of it, you know, of it being trauma related and something we have to fix. So anyways, this process would continue over and over again until I stopped the twitching, I stopped the swaying, and then physiologically didn't feel like my heart was pounding anymore. At what point do you uncover both eyes I'm trying to figure out, I've heard of EMDR for Mm -hmm. sure. I think it's very well known. Um, But I'm trying to figure out why the covering of individual eyes. I honestly couldn't tell you from, again, I'm not an expert in OEI, but as someone who experienced it, I can imagine it's because, um, you know, if, if we're expecting that the trauma memory is on one side of the body, you would want to almost lessen the impact of the intervention. So you don't want to make it too heavy on the person um, Mm -hmm. to process it all together. And I think that, I think maybe that's why they break it up into chunks and get you to cover one eye 
at a time. Okay, OEI. I had to look this up too. It stands for Observed and Experiential Integration Therapy. It's a therapy that came about in around 1994 by Bradshaw, Cook, and McDonald, working out of Vancouver. They mainly created this therapy for people with post-traumatic stress disorder. How many sessions of OEI did it take to minimize the physiological arousal you were experiencing? I would say three sessions. And the reason I know this is because, so when the break and enter happened, I felt like the next day and after I started having gaps in my memory about what had happened. Um, and there were huge holes that, that shouldn't have been there. Right. Um, and obviously it was because it was a traumatic thing. It was my brain trying to protect itself. But when I did the OEI in the third session is when I started filling in those gaps and remembering stuff that had happened. And it was the coolest thing ever because it seemed like that information was always there in my brain. I just wasn't seeing it. So that's when I felt like, okay, that anxiety had gone down. Now I'm starting to remember other details that were important. Um, But I didn't feel choked up when I was talking about it. So I think session three was when that change started happening. And uh, is that like, do you know if that's common in OEI to have you know, three to five sessions? Or can you go to like OEI like you do for a psychoanalysis, like, you know, twice a week for 10 years? I don't know. I, I, I can't imagine doing it twice a week because it was exhausting. My self-care plan after therapy um, was literally to just go home, get in bed um, and read a book or watch a movie because I just wasn't able to do anything else after. It was physically tiring. Um, and so I don't see anyone doing it more than once a week, but I do know that OEI is quite short term because it provides relief in a short amount of time. So I don't see people doing it for more than like 10 sessions, I'd say. Why do you think OEI worked for you more than other types of therapies? Well, and it's interesting because, you know, I'm, I'm a therapist trained in CBT, but one of the things that I sought out when I was looking for therapists was someone who wasn't CBT. Because I felt like, well, if, if they're going to do CBT with me again, um, I already know how to do this to myself and it's not going to work. So I think OEI worked really well for me because who I am as a person or I was as a person, I wasn't very in touch with my body um, and in touch with some of the somatic things happening for me. I was always very logical and thinking about the cognitive um, things behind stuff and I wasn't in touch with bodily sensations. I wasn't in touch with triggers and, you know, how my body was feeling at a certain time. So I think OEI really put me in touch with those things. And I think that's why it helped. Um, I also think it it helped because it was, you know, I got quick relief. I think if I had gone for 10 sessions and still hadn't felt better, I probably would have dropped out of therapy. It's so interesting. I really like your point around, you know, going to a CBT therapist wouldn't have worked because like you literally know exactly what kind of worksheet they would have handed you. Um, there was no element of surprise and, yeah. or even like, you know, spontaneity or anything that would have been like novel to your experience. And so what you were really seeking in, in processing this event was something completely new. Absolutely. And I think this is something that my therapist even brought up in our first couple of sessions. She said, Fatima, I know you're a therapist, but you have to stop acting like a therapist in your own session. Right. Um, and, and you know, that, that was quite true because there was a lot of faking good happening. There was a lot of, oh, yeah, like, you know, I have a great self-care routine and I do this, that, the other thing. And I, I, wasn't, um, I wasn't in it you know, I wasn't vulnerable as, as a client. I think I was still stuck in that therapist mode where I was taking that information in like, you know, another professional telling me what to do. So that, that was a, that was an interesting hat to put on to, to take off my therapist hat the minute I entered my own therapist's office and to put on a client hat and to almost see themselves as kind of like an expert in the room and forget that I was an expert in something too. I wonder if some of the hand movement that the therapist does acts as a cognitive distraction to be like, you can't think of the way of of your trauma story the same way if you're at the same time processing other visual stimuli. It is like a distraction technique. It is. And it it was quite challenging because, you know, one of the tasks was, okay, well, follow my hands pretty precisely. 
Um, and, you know, she would kind of wave them around like she was um, like a witch in Harry Potter doing spells. Uh, <laughs> and you'd have to, you know, watch her hands with your eye movements and follow them around. A- at the same time, you're telling your story. Wow. So I do think there's th- truth in what you're saying. It was a distraction technique. What do you think some of the misconceptions about OEI are if you've never heard of it before? If you were like telling a friend about OEI, how would you describe it? It's weird, but it works. <laughs> That's what I would say. <laughs> um, and, and quite honestly, I don't think I understand it quite fully yet because I obviously I haven't researched it beyond like a simple Google search, right? I'm not trained in it. But if I was telling a friend, I would probably say to, to, to stay patient with it and that it'll, it'll, it'll get you to challenge yourself. I think a lot of people are used to therapy um, with this idea that, you know, you kind of go and sit in a comfy chair and you you talk about your problems. OEI takes it a step further where you are talking about your problems, but you're on your feet standing. um, And it almost feels like exercise as you're watching this other person um, do their hand movements and, you know, being cognizant of that and telling your story at the same time. So it's a bit of a workout. It's a bit strenuous. I like that description as like a strenuous workout, it must feel very satisfactory to be doing something. It doesn't feel like that the first time. I remember coming out of my first session going, okay, well, what the hell just happened? And how did this help me? But when I made the breakthrough, like in session three, that's when I started believing a lot more in the validity of the whole thing. How do you think, you know, this experience was something that is not very widely known? Uh, How did it change your, I guess, understanding or appreciation for therapy in the first place? Uh, You know, I had been struggling um, with the aftermath of the break and enter for maybe two months before I reached out to the therapist. So I wasn't sleeping. I was a zombie um, every time. I would hear, you know, my neighbor, you know, in the apartment building open their own door, I would thought someone was breaking into my apartment. So you can imagine that it really impacted the quality of my life. So when I reached out to this therapist, I was expecting just talk therapy. And I was thinking, okay, well, this is just going to be a few more months of work, and maybe this will work. But then she said, let's try OEI. And in my head, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, we'll see right? Like I'm, I'm literally trying to humor her and myself. And when it worked, that's what I thought. I thought, holy shit, it worked. Like I can sleep through the night. I'm not jumping at the sound of doors opening. And when you're in a place where you think that's never going to change and it finally does, it's liberating. Mm-hmm. It is. It really is. And you know, a lot of, I guess, misconceptions about therapy I find from, you know, even my own clients or or myself sometimes that, you know, that the intervention will somehow take away uh, the pain or the emotion or whatever it is. Um, And it's not so much that it takes it away, but that you just think about it differently. Yes. It's meaning to you changes in a way. I think this therapy um, was really empowering for me because I finally realized that I was the agent of change. And, you know, previously when I would have gone to see a therapist, they would have said something insightful and that would have kind of provoked some change, right? This time around, my therapist did nothing but wave her damn hands around, right? And it just seemed like, oh my gosh, my own brain just healed itself, right? It just it just fixed the problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it, that was a great feeling to know that I truly had it within me to, to heal from this. Fatima, thank you so much for joining me today. Do you have any closing thoughts? I think it made me really aware as a therapist of uh, different therapies out there that aren't researched enough, right? Because in grad school, we're trained to look at a lot of therapies that have a, you know, they have empirical underpinnings that are researched a lot and, you know, they're gold standard. But now, um, as a therapist, I feel like I'm more open to some of these therapies that aren't as widely researched, not as widely known, because I feel like there are different things that would work for different people. Um, and I something worked for me, and I didn't ever think that it would. This has been the second episode of Whatever Works. Join me next time. This podcast is written and produced by me and edited by David Conroy and Jason Ball. 
The theme song for this podcast is called Universal Donor, off the album Hopeful Monster, written and performed by Jason Ball. You can find it on Spotify and Apple Music.